All right. Okay, so since we have uh, a sizable number of people here, so I guess uh, I'll start. Uh, as I mentioned, I'll talk about my data and what we're doing. So, hi everyone. Um, my name is Abdullah, and um, uh, I'm part of the PyData team and joined with Dania, uh, Sara, and Ruba as well. Uh, we're trying to, to organize these kind of talks every once in a while. And we're just a bunch of volunteers who are quite interested in, in uh, uh, the intersection of open source uh, and machine learning and data science. And uh, uh, recently, we, we've been uh, presenting lots of talks about uh, machine learning tools and uh, data science tools as well. But this talk is quite different, uh, uh, to say the least. Uh, uh, we're joined today by uh, Mark Sarofim, uh, and I believe uh, Mark to be one of the most uh, intriguing people to be uh, uh, seeing and, and, and hearing from, uh, uh, in the, uh, like in recent times. So, so what uh, the story of how he got to to uh, know Mark is actually through his infamous article where he talked about machine learning stagnation. And uh, in that article, he critiqued uh, quite hilariously the state of, of uh, machine learning research and development. And uh, I began following his, his, uh, like his streams and uh, his, his YouTube, YouTube uh, uh, videos and stuff. And uh, he recently published an, an article talk that is called The, the Sovereign uh, Student. And he, uh, in that article, he talked specifically about uh, like how could you educate yourself uh, uh, in, in computer science, like how, how could you overcome the prestige of, of uh, you know, uh, studying at a top university or whatsoever? So I think this this topic touched on on the current state and and uh, even in like machine learning space in the Middle East as well. So uh, we hear a lot from people asking, should I continue a PhD in in uh, and CS or whatsoever to work in machine learning? And I think Mark is going to talk about that. Uh, and I just told Mark. Uh, uh, like when I'm trying to introduce Mark, uh, we tried to write two sentences about uh, like his bio and uh, we struggled a lot, like what to choose from. Uh, he has done quite a lot, but uh, just to touch on that briefly, he's uh, transitioning to, to uh, become a, a partner engineer at PyTorch. And uh, he recently was working at Graphcore and Microsoft and he worked in numerous roles uh, from product management to um, uh, machine learning engineering and uh, so many other stuff as well. Uh, we'll we're glad to, to, to welcome Mark and uh, I don't want to ramble too much. So uh, uh, welcome Mark and uh, uh, please. Uh, Thank you, Abdullah. that's very kind of you. All right, should I just get started or are we uh, doing yeah, more intros? Go ahead, go ahead. Excellent, let me just share my screen. Um, all right, so, so, so hi everyone. So like Abdullah was saying, like I'm Mark, uh, and I'm here today to talk to you about, uh, you know, like, like sort of ideas I have around uh, how to self-educate yourself. Um, I think like my experience, like maybe so somewhat relatable because I started my career in, in, in Lebanon. So, so I'm originally Lebanese. Uh, so, so maybe there's like a few parallels that you can draw. Uh, please, if you have any questions throughout the talk, interrupt me as much as you want. Uh, I'm happy to talk, answer anything. And even after the talk, I'm happy to stay as long as you want to, to, to help answer any questions. So if there's anything you want to talk more in depth or anything relates to the slide, like feel free to interrupt me. Um, so that, like the ideas for a sovereign student really apply to learning anything. Uh, but uh, specifically, I want to talk about like, I, I think how, how this framework applies to machine learning, because this is, this is my field. I'm assuming this is a field a lot of you are interested in. Um, and if you are interested in following some of my thoughts later, like I'm basically on all the social medias. Uh, so, uh, and I'll talk a bit more about why actually as well, like why I think it's important you should do the same. So yeah, so I mean, let's just get started. So I was saying like, this is sort of like, I guess my bio, like I guess like now I'm, I'm gonna be joining the PyTorch team. So like, I'm pretty pumped about that. I think PyTorch is like an amazing product. And prior to that, like I worked at uh, like Graphcore, Microsoft, I have my own ebook on robotics. I worked at NASA, but you know, I sort of started my career at the UB in electrical engineering. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure like a lot of you can relate. It wasn't necessarily because I was interested in electrical engineering, but it's sort of like what I was supposed to do because, you know, it's like either this medicine or law, otherwise like my parents would have, you know, not taken me very seriously. Um, but, but, but I still think there's something to it. Like, I think this, this approach that our, our parents had, I think has, has a lot of weight to it and actually does work. And so we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that as well. 
Um, so, so, so why am I showing you this? Like the reason I'm showing you this is because if, if you look at this and uh, you know, you've, and if you've done more interesting stuff in your career, you shouldn't listen to me, you know, you should go like go on a walk or something. Uh, otherwise, if, if you feel like, okay, well, this is, this is interesting and you'd like to do the same, then hopefully some of my advice will help you. Um, so I'll start a video of punchline. Like, I mean, instead of introducing the thing, I'll just give you the conclusion straight up and then tell you how I arrived to this conclusion. Um, so generally, like what, what I find really important and sort of like what, bets, what best sets you up to learn stuff quickly is to learn real skills. And what I mean by real skills is that there's a few skills that have stood the test of time. So that's what Lindy means. Um, and there, there's stuff like writing, uh, speaking, uh, you know, sales and, and, and selling, you know, somewhat related. But the one I also want to talk about today really is, is really coding. So, so crafting, you know, so, so I think like, you know, historically, you know, you're woodworking with something, but woodworking kind of sucks because, you know, you can only make so much wooden stuff and you can't distribute them freely. Like it, 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 there's a lot of labor involved. Whereas with code, like you do something and millions of people can use it. So it's like very different and gives you a lot more leverage as someone who's like, let's say, let's say not born wealthy necessarily. And what's sort of not Lindy, I think not Lindy is skills I would call middle management skills. So basically if you're, if you have a job where your job is to email person A to person B, uh, I think this doesn't stand the test of time. And there's a couple of like, like, so maybe some of you, I see Abdullah smiling, but, but uh, I think like this may remind you of some stuff, like let's say consulting, for example, uh, I, I would qualify under this bucket, Like, yeah, you can make good money right now, but is this really sustainable long-term? Like who knows? Same for oil and gas. Like it's sort of a great job until all of a sudden, I don't know, people are moving towards alternative sources of energy. All of a sudden you need to do something else. Uh, so, so basically always think about like, yeah, you, you could have a career that's working out now, but think about like what, what, what may actually change at a systemic level and make sure that you're basically not homeless 20 years in the future because you just pick something and refuse to adapt to it. Um, so the, the blog post today really refers, it's sort of a summary of three different talks, uh, three different blog posts that I've written. So there is the, the de-schooling society, which was basically me talking about homeschooling a year before COVID. Uh, and it was a funny blog post for me because a lot of my friends at the time thought I was insane. They, they were like, you know, this is like a crazy guy. And he's so honestly, like, what do you mean uh, not go to school? Like your kids are going to be uh, antisocial and stuff like that. Uh, and then all of a sudden after COVID, it, it became like, oh, wait, actually, these ideas make a lot of sense. And people started to realize like why this model works. Um, the other one is sovereign student. Sovereign student really talks about how to self-educate yourself in computer science. So like, let's say if you wanted to do an undergrad from scratch. And I think the last one I want to talk about is how I read books, because I think even though that sounds very trivial, I think a lot of people do it wrong. So I want to give you some good tips that I think will, will, will help a lot when you're trying to learn stuff. So again, this is the, you know, I'm still giving you a conclusion. Um, so the, the process I've been sort of following that I think has worked pretty reliably uh, is, is what I call like working in public. And the idea behind working in public is that, you know, you're constantly reading stuff, right? You're learning, right? So you're, you're downloading some papers from archive, you're, you're summarizing stuff. Uh, and then you're just constantly reading. And then, you know, six months later, you're like, you know, what, the, like, what, what happened? Like, I didn't do anything. I'm just reading all the time. I don't feel particularly more ready because there's even more papers coming out. Uh, and, and so I think a good way to break away from the cycle is to basically, whenever you're reading stuff, make sure to summarize it and share it publicly. Uh, that way, at least you can sort of turn what you're working on into assets that other people can leverage. So one way, for example, is doing it on YouTube. Other ones like are picking out interesting ideas and tweeting them out. Uh, and, and the benefit, and by the way, this is why I'm on all the social media platforms, because for me, it's a way of meeting domain experts in areas that aren't limited by my geography. Like as in, I may not find the colleague or my neighbor who's interested in a topic, but I can always find someone on the internet who's interested in something uh, I'm doing. And so this lets me build, find domain experts. And once I meet these domain experts, uh, I can basically become their friends. I can write stuff with them and build stuff with them. And out of the stuff I built, some stuff may be free and open source, but really the goal is to uh, get stuff that I can charge people for. So think of it as a way to basically find co-founders at scale, where before it had to be your friend, your neighbor, your brother, whatever, but now it could just be any other person online that you, you know their work and you're familiar with. Um, so, okay, great. So that's the conclusion. Now, now let me give you the, the, the background behind how, how I got to this conclusion. So just so I, like, uh, we have this model called the lecture model, right? And this lecture model is like you sit in class and you know, it's basically, let's say someone like me and I'm just like transmitting information to you in a one-way way. 
Uh, and you can see sort of like in the back here, like even back in the day, like you had people falling asleep in lectures. So this is a problem that we've been aware of for hundreds of years, that lectures are boring. Uh, but seemingly we didn't really do anything about it. We just kept doing the boring thing. And we forgot why we had lectures in the first place. So for context, at some point in history, copying a book there before the printing press, you had to actually write down a book. You wanted, you wanted a copy of the Quran, you needed to just like sit down and write it. Okay, which meant that not a lot of people had it, right? Because it's very expensive. So if anything, and in some areas, like the, the buying, buying a book was about as expensive as buying a home. So this model made sense. You basically subscribe to a school so that someone who had money could read a book at you and then you take notes because it's too expensive for you to sit and copy it. And for some reason, even though books are very cheap now, if anything with online books, like books have basically essentially become free, uh, we still do this. And we, we haven't questioned like, well, maybe this model isn't the particularly most efficient one. Um, so, so really when, when I think of this this way is uh, like the modern education system is really, if you were to think of it more of a tradition, it's sort of the longest initiation right in history. So I spent, for example, 12 years in primary and, and, and school and high school. I spent four years in undergrad doing engineering at AUB and then two years in my master's. So that's a total of 16. I spent 18 years preparing for something without ever producing anything. And, and I just found it very bizarre. Like we all take this for granted because uh, you know, like, like ultimately we do this, well, why do this? Well, we wanna find a job or sometimes we'll say, well, well to get information. But I think like there's a big variable that, that changed recently that, that we don't really consider. So there's other issues that I have with, with education, right? So uh, I think some of, some of these may also be relatable to you. So one, it depends on your country of birth. Like, uh, you know, a story I like to give is that when I graduated from AUB, I was applying to all these tech jobs in the US. I got zero answers, like zero companies got back to me. When I was a grad student at UC San Diego, my first week there, I applied to all the tech companies, almost every single one responded back to me with at least a phone screen. Uh, and, and, and they also told me on phone screens like, wow, your projects are really cool and your CV is very interesting. And this was in reference to stuff I'd done at AUB, not at UCSD. And so this immediately made it click in my head. It's like, well, you know, as, as much as you think skills matter, it seems that like your country of origin actually matters a lot. And, and basically the, that's because like, it's very hard to tie away this prestige. And this sort of ties into another topic where like, let's say in, in Lebanon, uh, like education at the time wasn't very expensive. Now with the currency devaluation, it's very expensive. But at the time it was relatively affordable, whereas like an education in the US is very expensive. Uh, and so then, it, then it's a question of like, well, can you get financial aid? Well, you know, getting financial aid is very hard. You need to be w way better. Or it's like, well, like maybe your, your parents have the money for it. Then it's like, well, now it's contingent upon you having parents that had a disposable income to give you an education. So this is, I think, more of the financial side. But I also think that fundamentally, the, there's sort of always this false dichotomy between this is, you know, the theory of something versus the practice of something. And often these two things can be very far apart. And specifically, I'll talk about how that can be the case in deep learning. Uh, and, and I think the worst part, like what I personally hated about school uh, was this obsession with ranking. So for example, like if, you know, like there was a bad student and there was a good student, like you couldn't be good at your own interests. You had to be good at the interests that were the most important. Uh, and so that often means that like, you know, you can spend your life and it's basically, you're just getting a signal telling you that you're dumb but it's not particularly actionable. Like you're not really sure what to do with this information because inherently there, there is a ranking. It's not like you can say, uh, I, okay. And I think portfolios basically are one way to escape from this ranking trap. And I'll talk about portfolios in a second. Uh, and also there's a story I like to share from my high school. So I remember in high school, I was in a, I, I was in, it was a, it was a French high school. So it's called, called Collège Notre Dame de Jamour. Um, and we were in history class. And I just thought like it was it was just really boring. Like we kept talking about like the, the the third republic in France for like six months. And I was like, that's cool. Like, you know, I'm sure it's important and interesting, but I was personally bored of listening to the topic for six months. And so I was flipping my book and I was starting to read about like the Iranian revolution, or I started reading about the Cold War that the US had. I'm like, wow, that's so interesting. And I like was basically flipping the pages and reading everything. I was very excited. 
And when my history teacher saw this, she started screaming at me. She's like, what are you doing? Like, this is so disrespectful. Like, how, like, how dare you? Like, I'm teaching you stuff. And, and to me, what it made me think was like, well, I, I basically thought I hated history until two years ago. I'm 30 now. So I, I hated history until I was 28 years old. At 28 years old, I started really loving history because I realized, well, it, what matters is not there. There are no core events in history. What matters is the things that you're the space that you're interested in. Uh, and as long as there's something you're interested in, it, it, that's okay. Like, you don't have to be interested in what everyone else is interested in. I think school makes it very difficult to, to do this. So back to like, you know, what is the function of a university, right? So uh, I think I, I've heard people give various answers to what they think they are. And, I, and I'm actually curious uh, what you think a university provides you. But I think if I were to summarize them, here's what I think is the case. I think it gives you some information, right? It's like, here are some facts. Here's how this code works. Or here's what a, I don't know, binary for, breadth first search is. There's the idea of a peer group. So you meet friends that are doing similar stuff. You have mentors like professors doing, uh, that are more experts at something than you are. And lastly, I think there's the future opportunities aspect, which is it gives you a way to get a job. So like a way to get income or like whether it's consulting or engineering or whatever, like it gives you an on-ramp to, to get these jobs. Uh, and, you know, this worked fine for hundreds of years. Like this is fine. But then, you know, obviously there's like a big variable that changed, which is the Internet. So that with the Internet, this, this equation became a bit different because, well, the best content is free. You know, I, I'm sure a lot of you have spent a lot of time on YouTube or, you know, maybe you've seen some Medium blog posts or Substack articles that are often better than the lectures you've had. Uh, but you may, maybe, but maybe, you know, you, you look at those lectures and then you use them to pass your exams, but you don't think of like, wait, why am I doing this in the first place? So then the second aspect is that the best experts are within reach. Like, let's say, you know, you have people like Jeremy Howard, they're very active on Twitter. Uh, you, I, I can think of all sorts of experts on various machine learning topics that are there on Twitter. And as long as you ask them interesting questions, often they'll answer. And I'll tell you how to ask interesting questions in a second. And the last thing is that it, you know, when we think about this future opportunities aspect, I want you to think about, well, what do opportunities look like in the internet age? And I think really they come, it comes down to, you can, you're scalable. Like for example, like if, if, if I hadn't written an, an article about what I think are unrelated ideas and machine learning about stagnation, I would have never met Abdullah. He would have never invited me to come give this topic. And then, you know, we would have never met. And so I think like there's something to be said about the internet being a good engine to, to meet people. And it's very easy to do this if you spread your ideas or your code. And so I'll talk about these separately because like ideas are a way to make friends and peers, but code is really how you make a business. And I think those are very uh, interrelated ideas. Uh, so yeah. So, okay, great. So, so I think like, you know, I, I wanna talk about these sort of one by one, right? Like I wanna talk to you about, you know, like what, what do I mean by the best content is free? Well, like, what do I mean by the best experts over the reach? And what do I mean by the internet is the best distribution channel in history? Like how do you solve these problems very well without like, let's say if you didn't get the luxury of going to MIT or Stanford. Um, so the first one I wanna talk about is like how, how to read, right? And I think this sounds very trivial. Uh, you know, it's like, I, like I'm, it's like almost like I'm talking down at you, but, I, but I'm really not. I think how, how to read is a very important skill. And uh, I think what people do uh, is, is what I see is like they'll buy a book. And it's a very boring book, right? And then they'll like, they'll like grind and they'll try to read every single page linearly. And there's like so bored to death, but they don't stop reading because they think, oh, I have to read it. And so let me offer an alternative to this approach. Um, so what I noticed is that uh, sort of most books are bad. You know, and I think this is something that, that doesn't get said enough. Like most books are boring. Uh, and, but, but, but you don't know, like when you're starting, you don't know what's boring and what isn't. And so one, one good way of avoiding this problem is you buy lots of books. Uh, and whenever a book is boring, you stop reading it. And this, this sounds like, wait a minute, like, like, what do you mean stop reading it? And, oh, I just spent a lot of money. And it's a waste of money, right? Like, let's say you just spent $50 for a book. And, you know, that seems like a waste. But, but is it, well, so $50 isn't all that much when you consider like the value of a good idea is worth a lot more than $50. And compare that to how much you spent on undergrad. You know, it's definitely, I don't know, I don't know how much tuition is in Saudi, for example, but I would imagine it's substantially more than $100, than $50. So that's just like another thing to consider when you're thinking of the economics of this thing. The other thing is that typically when we're reading stuff, uh, you eventually do homework, right? As in you're, you're like, read something, then you get an exam. So this is how you're generally quizzed on information. Uh, but I also think another great way of doing it is writing a summary. Like if you can write a much more accessible version of something that other people can relate to, uh, I, I think this is the, sort of the same, but less stressful. 
exams, I still, I still think have an interesting place with projects, but I'll, but I'll sort of talk about that later. One thing I noticed that, well, okay, so ignore prerequisites. So when I was at UCSD, uh, like, okay, so, so there's like these core classes in op operating systems and computer architecture. And at the time they told me that like, well, before you take these graduate classes, uh, you need to take the prerequisites for undergrad. So I, I did the, I, I, I thought about it, I'm like, wait, so that means I'm gonna be doing OS and computer architecture for a year. But what I really wanna be doing is machine learning. So screw that, I'm gonna say I took the class and then I just basically signed up for a graduate class and I didn't do particularly good. Maybe I got like a B minus or something, but I didn't care because for me, the time I gained was more important. Like it's, it's like I wanted more time to do research, to make peers, to, to do projects. I didn't wanna spend time just getting A's. Like that didn't feel like that was the main point of me being there. Uh, like that, that wasn't really my goal. And I, I feel like people really overestimate prerequisites where like, yeah, if you're trying to get an A plus, maybe they're important, but if you're not, it's, they're not important at all. Um, and I think like maybe one thing that people really forget and, and I've alluded to already is that if you find some something boring, stop reading it. And, and this is gonna sound like it's contrary to all your instincts because your whole life you've been doing the opposite. You know, you've pushed through boring stuff. But you know, what, what I'd like to claim is that if you find something boring, you're very unlikely to be good at it. You're very unlikely to be the best at it, let alone good at it. Uh, so why not find something that you are interested in and then, and, and then dive deeper into that topic? And what, what I like to think, I think procrastination, people treat procrastination as this thing to avoid, like this thing you have to beat out to, from under you. Uh, but I would argue procrastination is actually information. Like it's telling you, you're probably not the world's greatest at this thing, find something else to do. And the final point is, you know, please, for, for the love of God, like burn all your self-help books. Like they are a complete waste of your time and they can make you, give you the illusion of reading profound things and I'll give you an example. Like, look, so like, let's say I'm self-help book author one, and I'm going to say, patience is a virtue. You're going to be like, wow, like that's, that makes a lot of sense. Or I can say, no, 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 being quick is a virtue. You're going to be like, wow, that makes so much sense. And what I'm getting at here is that most advice is anecdotal. Like you don't know what is good and bad advice. You need to sort of try out things for yourself and see what works for you. So first principles over self-help advice. And in all cases, most of the self-help books that you read today are derived from uh, meditations by Marcus Aurelius. So they literally plagiarize a, like, like a book that's over a thousand years old and they plagiarize it badly. And even then it sounds to me like when I read Marcus Aurelius that he was really, really depressed in his life. So I wouldn't necessarily listen to advice from someone who was this depressed. Uh, so that's, a, that's, a, that's another point. So like, okay, let's talk about first principles for a second. So I had this meme in the article that, uh, you know, this is an LSTM. So an LSTM is a form of sequential architecture that's used for sequences in machine learning. Uh, and if you're reading blog posts about it, you're like, well, it's like it has all these crazy feedback loops. It's like this thing that you're unrolling. But then when you actually look at the code, you realize like, wait a minute, it's just a bunch of matrix multiplications. And there's like some sigmoids and 10 H's and that's it, you know, and then maybe there's the, the state is added onto it. But, you know, you can read this and you look at it. It's like 10 lines of code and you can do re just read this and be understand LCMs forever in five minutes. And instead of wasting like weeks looking at it from a more mathematical standpoint, that actually makes what you're doing more difficult to understand. Like the, the, the mathematical formalism actually gets in the way of what's actually happening because what's happening is a matrix multiplication. The math is, is cool to look at maybe after you've understood this, but if you understand this, it makes the math, understanding the math a lot easier. Whereas if you just look at the math and you've never looked at deep, deep learning library, it's actually very difficult to just re-implement this from scratch. And if you can't re-implement it from scratch, do you really understand it? It's kind of like, like you, you know some cool symbols, like cool, but it's not, it's not helpful or first principle information that helps you do interesting stuff. So when in doubt, you know, I have a good heuristic as read the source code. Like if you don't know how something works, go to the, I don't know, the PyTorch GitHub. You want to figure out how like a ResNet works for images, you know, look at it. You'll understand all image algorithms if you just look at the ResNet implementations. You want to understand how to work with sequences, look at RNNs. You want to understand how Transformer works, you know, do that. Or maybe also like read uh, Jay's tutorial, which is excellent. Uh, but, but my point here is that uh, we've gotten to a point in, in, in software where there's so much software, like there's so much code out there available uh, that if you're a good person, if you know how to read code efficiently, 
it's kind of a real skill, which is kind of intuitive. And I've called this skill GitHub archaeology, because you're sort of trying to go through old code and trying to figure out like what it really does and stuff. But but I think that's really the state we're in. Like there is so much stuff. And if you're just a person that can make a sense of it, one, this will benefit you professionally because you can understand things more quickly and do things more quickly. But also if you're trying to do your own library, you're not dealing with all like the sort of like the, the BS layers to get there. Like you can very quickly understand new things very quickly. So this is like, I think a very, like, again, first principles is a very, very powerful heuristic to generally have when you're, whenever you're doing anything. Um, so I'll give you an example. So I had at work, uh, I wanted to start working with proteins at GraphCore. And I realized like a lot of my colleagues were really scared of this field because generally when people say machine learning, I don't know why they generally mean images and language. I don't know why, but it's sort of like, because these are two domains that you can tackle without having any specific domain knowledge. And so I started to look into proteins. And by the way, like I, I, I always sucked at biology. Like I, I barely took, I, maybe I took one human anatomy class in, in, in undergrad. I didn't pay much attention in it either. But like when I looked at this space, I'm like, I tried to view it more from first principles as in, okay, like what is really happening? Like, well, I have this like blob of, of you know, DNA data floating in like a liquid, in a liquid. So I'm like, well, you know, I want to learn what the sequence is, right? Because people deal with DNA sequences. Well, so really you have an image and you're trying to turn it into a sequence. So which algorithm is likely to help you? Well, convolutional neural networks. So, okay, great. Now you have a 2D sequence and you're trying to figure out how this thing folds, for example, in space. Like what is the 3D structure of it? So you can use something like a transformer or a recurrent neural network because, uh, so amino acids, so basically individual, individual elements of the sequence, uh, where, where they have high attention between each other are likely to fold. Therefore, transformers are very helpful for proteins. So again, if you've read Jay's tutorial on how to do transformers on language, you can the exact same code use it on proteins. And this is very powerful because this means that now you, you've learned something and you can use it in many ways. And this is generally, I think, a very common trend for first principles. And the last one is like, let's say now, now we're getting to researchy stuff. Like now you have a 3D structure and you're trying to analyze it. Like does this protein, for example, uh, solve a sickness? Like, does it solve for this drug? Will it cure COVID? And because, so you have a graph and you're trying to do a classification or a regression on it. Well, you know, we have these architectures called graph neural networks that take graph like data uh, and, and, then, and then do something with it. But then you may think like, well, a graph like that sounds really complicated. And then I'll say, well, is it? Well, think of a convolutional neural network, right? So a convolutional neural network works over an image. Um, and so in, what, what's an image? It's a, basically a, like, a, like a, a, a 2D matrix. Right. So what's a graph? Well, it's also a 2D matrix, right? Because it's like which nodes are like the adjacency, adjacency matrix, like which nodes are connected to which other nodes. So again, you've taken something you know and you've applied it to something new. And just because you had the courage to do so, like now you're doing more interesting stuff in your day-to-day -day life as opposed to doing what everyone else is doing. Uh, so yeah, basically try to abstract things as much as possible. And once you uh, don't understand something you like you can sort, sort, sort of start going deeper but taking this high level approach i think is very helpful sometimes to tackle problems that are out of your comfort zone so really the the situation you want to avoid is this like there's a there's a term i like to call tutorial hell which is you're like okay i want to look at how to implement cnns and pytorch okay now in tensorflow now in keras now in jax now in dex now in Haskell. Now, okay, I want to do it with this lot and that lot. And then it's like, well, well, you'll be dead by the time you're done with it because there's so much content being produced that it's pointless. So instead of doing this, you know, focus on some problems that you think are more interesting and, and, and generally go deep instead of going like with this breadth. And again, because if you're back to the first principles analogy, tutorial hell is the opposite of first principles because you're learning in a very shallow way the same thing as opposed to if you, again, you looked at, okay, a CNN is really just matrix multiplication and LSTM is just matrix multiplication. You won't feel the need to read the tutorials because you'll feel like even though you haven't read it, you sort of know everything in it already. So, so you, you gain a lot of uh, free time as a result. So, you know, people ask me a lot, like, well, what do I need to know for ML? And then, you know, should I go do a master's and stuff? Well, you know, maybe, but because the, I think the master's, the prestige helps, you know, and I'll talk about prestige in a second. But really, the, the core ideas that you know are really this. Like, I don't think there's much more than that. But and again, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. So like with linear algebra, there's all sorts of garbage references on linear algebra. The best one is linear algebra done right by, by, by Stephen Axler. It's amazing. You know, buy this book. It's worth every single, every single penny. The other thing to consider is that today, machine learning has gotten to a point where uh, it sort of doesn't matter. Like, you don't know what's going to work, right? You need to try out different loss functions, different architectures. So you being efficient 
is a real skill. And by being efficient, I mean DevOps. Like, can you run hundreds of experiments at once or dozens of experiments? Can you look at the results in a scalable way? Oh, by the way, Abdullah, if you see any interesting questions, because I can't read them, just feel free to read them at me if anything, if anyone was asking something. Um, yeah, then, then I think there's stuff like the basic project life cycle. Like people ask me a lot about Kaggle. Like, should I do Kaggle? And I say yes to an extent, because I think hyper-optimizing for Kaggle has diminishing returns. But the core process, the life cycle is very important, as in, can you load data to a model? Can you fit a model? And can you generate some dashboard to look at what the model did? I think this is something you do over and over again. It's like practicing scales in music or something. It's something you do a lot, or like, I don't know, doing push-ups before you exercise or going for a run for your exercise. Like, these are basic skills that are very worthwhile practicing. Uh, other stuff, like let's say ML algorithms, like, yeah, you can go to research very quickly, but there's this book called 100 page ML book. You know, if you just read it, you know, you'll know 80% of what you need to know. Uh, how to build models from scratch, for example, how to implement logistic regression from scratch, I think is very important to do once, like implementing gradient descent once, I think is very important. So there's this book by Joel Gross, Data Science from Scratch, it's amazing. You know, read it, it's worth, every, it's, it's worth all your time. And for statistics, I think also it's a very dense field, but there's this book called All of Statistics, and even though it has a scary name, it's not actually that big of a book. And it's actually very clear. It's not, it doesn't, even though it, it, the title makes it sound like a dictionary, it's not, it's a very good book. And so, you know, you've seen now, like, you know, even though this seems like a big field, there's about really four books that I'm recommending. And obviously the, it gets very deep very quickly, but these will sort of be a good foundation. I think that will take you less time than a master's, right? So like, instead of spending two years, you can spend two months, you know, three months reading this and you'll have the same amount of knowledge. But, you know, like this sort of gets to the point where like what is really uh, undergrad about? Is it really about the knowledge or is it about the prestige? But anyway, I, 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 let me let me read some questions right now because I saw there were a couple. Where is it? Uh, okay, I see. So people are just saying, okay, yeah, I see it's just an answer. Okay, never mind. Uh, so, so let me give you another example, for example. So here, the, 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 there's a... I like to call some aspects of machine learning like unpopular basics. So there's this algorithm, for example, called automatic differentiation, which lets you take a network and get all its derivatives. And this is very important for backprop. And typically the way we, we teach this in, in ML masters, for example, is we go through the like the the, the chain rule and, 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 and gradient updates and stuff. But let me give you another example. So let's say you want to take the derivative of x squared plus one, right? So there, there's this uh, like there's a, there's this, there's these kinds of numbers called dual numbers where they're sort of like complex numbers, but if you take the square of a dual number, you have zero instead of minus one, like that's it. And so now instead of evaluating a function at f of x, you evaluate it of f of x plus epsilon, where epsilon is a dual number. So you know how how do you multiply x plus epsilon squared? Well, so it's what you learned, and so this is an equal here. Sorry, so this would be. Uh, x, like x squared plus epsilon squared plus 2x epsilon plus 1, right? Uh, and then because we know that epsilon squared is equal to 0 by definition, once you work this expression out, you end up with x squared plus 1 plus 2x epsilon. And x, so 2x, so x squared plus 1, like the part that doesn't have an epsilon attached to it, is the derivative. Like, and that's like 2 here, like 2x is the derivative of x squared plus 1. And so it's like a simple trick, right? Like that's it. All I showed you was like one number. It's like, okay, we did this. And this is, this is really what the libraries do. They do this, of course, in a more scalable way. And there's much more tricks about it. There's a whole literature about it. But it's a powerful trick. And it's actually a lot simpler to explain, at least for me, than explain something like backprop, where you know, maybe you've seen two hour lectures about backprop. And here, maybe, like, I don't know if you fully understood it, but maybe in, like, in about 10 seconds. And if you stare at the expression long enough, you can convince yourself that this, this makes sense. But you know, that's it. Like, like it, it's really a simple trick. And often it comes down to this. Like, that's why I tell you, don't read boring stuff because often boring stuff are very badly explained. Whereas the simple stuff that make you feel good and, and smart are often well explained. Um, it, it's sort of like, um, like, like Feynman talks a lot about this. Like, you know, there's lots of bad explanations in the world. And so try to find good ones. They'll save you a lot of time. Um, and so another thing I want to talk about is, you know, so, so I mentioned that being the best in machine learning today is a very unrealistic goal because like, who are you competing against? Like you're competing against Jan LeCun. Well, Jan LeCun has been doing this for 30 years before it was popular. Uh, he's probably going to keep being better at you at core deep learning, but the intersection is wide open. So I don't know why. I think maybe it's just, I think it, it comes down to a domain expertise kind of thing, but a lot of ML people 
narrowly focus on images and languages and recommender system. And it's like all other problems don't exist, but let's say there, there's a lot of stuff. There's like semiconductors, there's robotics, like genomics, proteins, physics, chemistry, programming language, compilers, distributed systems, uh, even sales and product. Like the intersection is so wide open. And there's this almost like obsession where people have like horse blinders on where they only focus on the problems that they've seen in textbooks. And they refuse to see that like, well, these techniques are very useful everywhere. Uh, I think deep learning has gotten to a point today where if you say I'm a deep learning expert, that's like saying I'm a bash expert, where in of itself, that's not very useful. You need an expertise that goes with it. Like it's like programming. So great, you know how to program. What, what do you program? You can't say I'm an expert at programming and not have done any system. Like, and so again, I want you to think about like when you're trying to be relevant in the job market, think about acquiring skills at the intersection because you're very likely to be differentiated because everyone I know is doing this. Even people that are starting their PhDs now are just doing the top thing. So, you know, I've talked again about uh, working in public. So this was the conclusion, but just to reiterate it here, I think a good process to learn things quickly is to summarize stuff, share the summaries, meet the main experts in a, in a subject area, uh, build a library with this product, get free users and get paid users. I think this is like a very reliable way of, of starting a business uh, because you have uh, rewards all along the way. Like, it's not like you're working on something and then two years later, it's gonna work out. Like you're constantly gonna get positive re Enforcement, you're going to constantly be meeting people. And, and just to talk about myself, like after I wrote my article, uh, it's been really easy to meet people. Like it's been kind of amazing actually that like there's all sorts of people that I never thought would be interested in talking to me. But now because they know me via something I wrote, like we can have like, these long chats and go on walks together, go have dinner together. Uh, and so now, now I can learn more from them and then I can do more interesting stuff. So there's feedback loops. But, but I think to sort of get started with the feedback loop, it all comes down to having what you do be publicly available. Um, think of it this way, like, like the academics that you read about in machine learning, like a big part of why you're aware of them is because they bothered to publish their papers. Like they bothered to publish their code and then you use it and then you love it and then you know them, right? So let's say with Francois Cholet, you used Keras, then you, then you knew about Fran Francois Cholet because you liked Keras. So, so this is sort of how you want to think about because like may maybe, like, like maybe that's an ambitious goal at least to get started, but it shows you that th this idea of you sharing your work and then using it in some other way is, is very valuable. And I think it's something that you don't learn in school that, uh, that I would encourage you to pursue a, a bit. Uh, just a, so, a, a question on, on the previous uh, slide that you were talking about. Uh, I, I think also on, on the context that you talked uh, uh, previously in, in other talks uh, as well, when you uh, actually wanted to, to uh, uh, build your own company at some point, right? Uh -huh. So uh, you actually found out that, uh, you know, going through the steps from one to, to six is actually better than just diving uh, onto just building uh, something new out of nothing. So uh, can you expand on, on, on that uh, through your experience? Why did you tr try to build a company? Uh, sure, yeah. So basically the, so when, when I started the company, it was, I, I, I was working at Microsoft at the time and I decided to, to quit and all of my friends and family thought I was crazy. They're like, you know, why are you quitting? Like, you don't have a plan. Uh, it, it's not concrete, you know, like, and they were like, but, but you're learning, you're at Microsoft, right? Like, isn't Microsoft great? And, and I said like, well, actually, to be honest, I feel that while Microsoft is doing great stuff, I as an individual wasn't feeling like I was growing particularly fast. I felt like my my programming skills were eroding because I was learning mostly the specific infrastructure that Microsoft had. I wasn't doing open source tools. Uh, instead of do, doing research, I was spending a lot of time with legal teams. Uh, instead of like coding, I was in meetings. Uh, and so I felt like, well, there's a, this perception on the outside that well, everything is moving fast because you look at the PR announcements at Build and it's like amazing. But you know, at the end of the day, like I'm not Satya, like I'm just like some dude who works at Microsoft. And I, I felt like I was basically turning into a turkey. And so I, I wish I had a turkey slide here, but, but the turkey, uh, the analogy, I like it. So Natsim thought it introduced the idea to me. But basically, uh, you know, imagine you're a Thanksgiving turkey, right? And then you're looking at your weight every, every day and it's increasing. You know, every day you're, you're getting fatter and fatter and you're like getting more and more comfortable. And you're like, this is gonna go on forever, right? Like I can be infinitely fat doing this. But then one day you realize like, wait a minute, like there's Thanksgiving and all of a sudden you're, you go from like being weighing, I don't know, like 10 pounds, now you weigh zero, right? Because now you're dead. 
Uh, and so I think like I was starting to feel like a turkey where I, I knew that in the short term, my skills were valuable, but I felt like in the long term, I wasn't building Lindy skills. I was becoming a bureaucrat, whether I wanted to or not. And I didn't want that. Like I wanted to feel like I'm still doing cool research. I'm still doing cool products. Like I'm learning a lot. I'm meeting people. And definitely I could have done it, by the way, in hindsight at Microsoft, because I think Microsoft gives you an environment to do this kind of stuff. But I wasn't in that mindset. So when I left, I was like, I want to start my own company. Uh, and I was basically just doing, uh, going straight to this, where I would always think like, well, like I, I would do a project, but then I think like, well, I can't make money from this project. So then I would stop working on it. But I had, I continued often for a couple of days or a couple of hours, like not even months. Well, I could have built an audience. And then if I build an audience, there's people that know me. And then if I want to sell something, people know about me. Whereas what was happening to me is I would work on some code and then I would share it on Twitter and like no one, no one knew who I was. Like, why would they trust me? Like, what, like, like who is this random dude that left their job at Microsoft who has no expertise in game or game AI? Like, why should I trust them with my company? And I realized, by the way, after writing, uh, so after I sort of gave up, I started writing an ebook uh, on robotics and, 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 and game AI. And the book became very popular, like it, it, like several chapters made it to the front page of Hacker News. And then after, after it did, a lot of people were reaching out to me telling me, hey, like, I saw that you do this. Do you want to help me do this for my own company? And I was like, wait a minute. Like, this is what I wish I had a year ago. Like, why didn't I do this a year ago? And the reason I didn't do it a year ago is because I was taking too much advice from people I admire telling me, like, they're like, no, you should focus on the company. Like, this stuff is all irrelevant. Like, you writing content is a waste of time. And maybe in that, and like, what I was like, think is like, in the absolute, maybe it's a waste of time. But for me, it wasn't. For me, it was very motivating. I enjoyed writing the book. I was good at writing. And I met people and I could have sold them something. And so it felt like I don't care what people like, I don't know, like self-help gurus say. That's why I tell you burn the self-help books because they give anecdotal advice and you need to find what works for you. And what I realized like, well, I'm, I'm actually, even though I'm a programmer, one of my biggest strengths is I'm a good writer uh, and I wasn't using it. But when I started using it, all of a sudden, all these opportunities were opening up that would have never opened up in the past. Uh, and I think, this is a fair, I think this is fairly reproducible because even now, I'm constantly meeting experts at various stuff. And so like I can constantly entertain ideas, do little side projects without feeling the pressure to share them or make money from them. And I feel like by virtue of iterating a lot on this stuff, it makes it very easy for me to eventually find something that can, that can make money. Uh, and so that's why I'm very bullish on this process. So this is something I'm just doing myself. Like, I mean, again, I, I think whenever you listen to advice, don't listen to people telling you advice if they don't do it themselves. Like, so I'm not telling you to do this. I'm telling you, this is what I do and I like it. You know, if it works for you, great. Let me know. I'd be, I'd love to hear about it. And if not, you know, that's great. I'm sure uh, you'll find other things that work better for you and, and your strength. Uh, Marco, I have a question from Turkey. Uh, he's asking about uh, in general, like FOMO, how to get over FOMO. Uh, uh, he was talking about, you, you know, fear of missing out the, the, the what's uh, latest happening in, in, in deep learning or uh, machine learning or whatsoever. So he gets, uh, uh, again, back oh, into the, the tutorial hub, like, like you yeah. mentioned. Um, um, yeah, so, so basically, I, I think the quick answer there is that, like, well, it, like, look at the end conclusion of FOMO. Like, if you wanted to now, let's say, stop what you're doing and read all the ML tutorials that exist today, you're going to be dead by the time you're done. And so it sort of tells you, like, this is not, in, in the extreme case, it's not a sustainable approach to, to dealing with stuff. So let's say, so that's, that's like, but, but I think what you're also hinting at is like the psychological effect, right? You're saying, well, how can I not feel guilty or feel bad or feel like other people are missing out? And my point there will be uh, this one. So you'd be surprised. So, so I have like, oh man, like I, I feel like, I, mean, I wish I made this deck twice as big, but uh, like, cause I, cause I knew time would be short, but anyway, like, it's okay. We have time, I'll stay after, but okay. Um, so, so like you'd be like so like let's say with a vote like maybe uh, Daniel may, maybe take a guess like uh, how many people do you think maintain PyTorch like like uh, how many core people maintain PyTorch like let's say roughly oh um, maintainers so maybe let's say around twenty okay it's closer to four like <laughs> like, like like and my point there is that you would always expect like here's one library used by millions of people. Right, so you're like, oh, it must have 20, like dozens of maintainers. Well, actually, go to the commit graph on GitHub, 
And you'll notice that there's four people that have like hundreds of thousands of lines in the code base, and then everyone else has fixed white space. Maybe they've added a tutorial. So it's sort of like these very like low value uh, like pull requests. And so my point there is that like, well, there's actually surprisingly few people doing the hard work. And so if you can be one of these people, you're never going to be unemployed. You're, you're, and you're going to be rich very quickly because you have domain knowledge that is highly sought after that is hard to reproduce. Like you're competing against four other people. But if you want to compete on the, how many architectures do I not randomly know about? Well, like, you know, you're competing against like thousands of people because ML is today a highly sought after uh, discipline because it pays well. So a lot of people are going to want to do it. And so you're competing against all these random people and then you're competing on prestige, right? So now then it's going to come down to, well, everyone knows all the dumb architectures. So why, like, I'd rather take someone who knows all the dumb architectures at Stanford instead of you. But if you're one of the people that uh, like actually d produced a library, well, all of a sudden you're not competing against anyone. And I actually think you have a great, uh, a great example of this approach. Like here in this audience, like I've talked about Jay three times now, but, but think about it. Like, I mean, so you, like you have someone who I, I'm assuming uh, grew up in Saudi Arabia who wrote a tutorial, who's, that's probably one of the single best tutorials on transformers. And all of a sudden this gives him, gives him a brand name outside of Saudi Arabia. Like now people know who he is because they're, they're reading it. And so, you know, either write a tutorial that's as good as that or write a library that's as good as that. And all of a sudden, you're not really competing against anyone. Like there's one J, you know, there, there's, but there's millions of people that know what CNNs are. True, I see, I see Jay's uh, commenting on the chat. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so is, are, are there any more questions in the chat? Because it's hard for me to see them while I'm talking. Or... Uh, no, you, you can move on. OK, cool. So, so let's take this example, for example, like here. So typically when we're used to the schooling model, it looks something like this. So you, you listen to a lecture, you know, right? then you do some homework, then you listen to some more lectures and you do some more homework. Eventually you do a final, and then you get a grade. If you got a 60 or a 90, it doesn't matter. You just pass and then you move on to more advanced classes. Uh, but I think this approach is closer to breadth first search. It's like there's, it's claiming that there's like some foundational knowledge that exists in the world. And that once you know this foundation now, it's like now you can think about the real problems. And I think this is totally wrong, by the way. So the, 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 the model I'm advocating for instead is, you know, read and listen to as many references at once. So basically try to find stuff that you're interested in. And once you do find a couple of topics that you're interested in, summarize them, write a good tutorial about them. Once you do, find a few relevant open source projects that do what you're doing. Solve a very applied problem with them. So basically just download that, like do model.fit basically. Uh, and then you're like, okay, well now you know the basics. Now, now you know how this thing works. You know the theory, you know the practice. Now it's like, now, now it's the time to contribute. Like this is sort of the next level of mastery or, you know, pick a random GitHub issue from an open source project that you like. It doesn't have to be popular by the way, just a random one and, and do a contribution there. Become friends with the library maintainers make your own open source project and maybe like final step, try to make money from what you learned working on that open source project. So this, this, is, this gives you a path where like, you know, so sort of maybe here, uh, if I were to add some stuff to the traditional school model, maybe after the do more advanced class, you're gonna have something like, well, uh, I don't know, like do uh, case studies and then, you know, do an interview and then, you know, work at a company for 10 years. And, and, and you know, sure, like th th this path has worked in the past, but it's sort of almost pretending like the internet doesn't exist. Like you literally have the most powerful information tool in human history. And I think not using it does you a huge disservice because if you do use it, you can sort of turn your career into something entirely different and a lot more powerful. So well, what does this look like applied to machine learning? So this, I gave you the sort of the general framework here. Applied to machine learning, there's a very basic example, let's say applied to NLP. You know, you want to learn the basics of ML, you know, download fast AI, read data science from scratch, read the 100 page ML book. So now you have like the basics, right? After that, you know, pick a few ideas that you really liked and summarize them in a few blog posts. Great, so now you know basics of ML, took you a couple of months. Uh, then what you could do is you could download Hugging Face, which is like the most popular NLP library and train it on a custom data set of your own. Maybe do it on an Arabic data set because that's, you know, uh, the, the intersection of uh, Arabs that do NLP is smaller than the intersection of people that do NLP. So all of a sudden you just did something that's more unique. Uh, four, you know, you pick a, let's say you pick an issue on their GitHub and fix it. So either c commit your, your contributions back to them or fix something else. 
uh, meet the maintainers. You know, it doesn't have to necessarily be the core ones, as in not the CEO. Meet a couple of other people in this community and become friends with them. Make your own open source project, and you know, eventually build your own company. So this is, I think, uh, like, like a good way to, to think about this. And and, and I think, like, uh, you know, one thing I, I I feel like I need to talk about here is that. When I say make your own company, like I'm very well aware this is very hard. Like I tried doing it and I failed. So I'm not saying this is something you should reliably do. But let, let me give you a, a sort of a, a theory here. So, you know, we've noticed nowadays that uh, tools like auto, auto ML has become more popular, right? So now it's become a lot easier to just try a bunch of stuff out and do it at scale. Uh, we've also learned that the architecture sort of don't matter because if you can just do auto NLP, a lot of the very don't matter. What matters is that you're just able to try them all out and see what works. So basically, now it's the, the tooling, right? It's the, the distributed systems and tooling. So basically, if you just really tell yourself, oh, I want to do ML algorithms, you're very quickly going to realize like, well, you know, maybe you're a turkey now and, and your skills are no longer very, as useful as you thought they were, even though right now they are. So again, first principles go back to core knowledge, either do distributed systems or go towards stuff at the intersection. But if you're, if you're gonna think that like, oh, like if I do auto NLP, you know, if I just use auto NLP, like I'm gonna go make seven figures in the future. Like, I think you're gonna be very sorely disappointed. Uh, and this also tells you that in the future, uh, I think companies are gonna become a lot smaller because what's gonna happen is like, let's say a tugging face, you're gonna have a few core team members doing everything and then you have a community building stuff for them for free but they're not paying you like they're only like only the core ones are being paid because their work is, is generally of a higher quality and they're actually driving and building the community around it so don't assume that because you can get a high paying job at a company like facebook or microsoft today that this is going to go on forever that said if you can get a job there right now of course you should go because you're going to make a lot of money and you're going to learn a bunch and you should do it but always think about like, well, maybe the skill is not going to be very useful in the future. So, but if you can, if you have the ability to be either your own media company or build your own open source company, you're never going to be unemployed because you have the full stack skill set of a business, you know? And also the benefit is you don't need investors. You don't need uh, to have hundreds of employees. Like you don't need to be limited by your geography. Like you could be sitting, like, you know, uh, you know, hanging out with your mom, but also like, you know, on the, like on your laptop, you're running like a billion dollar business. Like this wasn't possible a couple of years ago. And I think it'd be a shame that not, not, not to use this, this huge advantage, I think, that the internet has given us. Um, so I've talked about acquiring information. And, uh, and I think another thing about universities, right, that we mentioned is how to find peers. Uh, and, and I think this is a sort of very uh, underrated skill set. And it's basically the sales skill set, right? And I think this is a very important skill set because if you can sell stuff, well, you know, you're the useful person in the room. Like you're actually the one bringing money to a business. You're the one building value. Uh, and I think making friends is, is pretty much that, right? So it's basically about when you're reaching out to people, I, I often get people asking me, do you want to connect or do you want to compare notes? And I have not, I don't have a very high opinion of these people because it's just kind of like, well, what do you want to connect about? Like, what, what do you want to talk about? Like, just tell me how you're going to help me or tell me how I can help you, like be specific. And then it's great, then we can collaborate on something. But if you just tell me, I want to connect, it's kind of like, cool. Like you just added me to an address book that you're never going to revisit. Like we're, we're, neither of us are high value connections to each other. And so an example, for example, of this is like, let's say you want to meet a famous open source library developer. It's very easy. You know, you look at, remember what we mentioned is that like, you know, PyTorch has four core developers. Well, let, let's not take PyTorch, let's take a slightly less popular library. Uh, let's add no scikit-learn. If you do an interesting tutorial for them, or if you fix a major bug that they have, you're gonna you you can email the developers and be friends with them. They they will answer you like like they they will listen to you ramble about whatever you want for an hour. Uh, however, they don't have the time to connect with you because they're busy people. Like they're, they're doing very high leverage stuff. They're very smart people. A lot of people want their time, and so if you're just asking for their time, like you're basically asking me to give you a favor. And I just, I don't know you, like, why would I do that? Like my time is valuable, right? Like imagine, like think of it this way. Like, let's say take the yearly salary at like a place like Facebook, right? And then divide it by the number of hours in a day. And if you're just asking me to connect, you're basically asking me for that amount of money. And so I, I'm generally not likely to be very receptive. But if you wanna be valuable to me, you wanna show me interesting references, teach me something, show me how I made a mistake in one of my blog posts, correct something, I will talk to you hundred percent. And Abdullah like, is actually a good example of this. Like, we talked a lot back and forth 
on Twitter DMs. He's on my Discord group. We talk. He shared interesting stuff. I've shared interesting stuff to him before he asked me to come give a talk. But if you just asked me to come give a talk, it's like, well, you know, I, I would be like, well, is this talk going to be worth my time? He'd think, well, is, is, is Mark going to be interesting? But what I thought was interesting was because I trust Abdullah, because I met him online, I would give the talk here even if one person showed up because like I trust him, like I like him. And so I think that you can do this at scale, like basically try to make friends online. Don't try to make connections online because no one really needs connections. Like I have enough colleagues, like what I want is more friends that are interested in what I'm doing. And I'm more than happy to oblige people there. And you call them LinkedIn bots, right? I do call them LinkedIn bots. So, okay, so LinkedIn bots are basically people that don't have opinions of their own. They share what their company announces on LinkedIn and or they just retweet stuff constantly and you look at their profiles and it's very it's low value like i don't know what what you're thinking i don't know what you what you stand on on issues like i don't know anything about you you're, you're a bot like you, you could literally be i could program a bot that like looks for the word machine learning and then retweet everything that does that and that would pretty adequately summarize most linkedin accounts that that have connected to me um instead i think try to think about okay great well someone announced something say something interesting about it. Like, I mean, what is something that it's like a lesser known aspect of this or what's uh, something that you could do that people don't realize that you could do with this feature. And so it, it seems counterintuitive, but the more specific your knowledge is, generally the more valuable it is. The more general it is, it's sort of like, I don't know, uh, like vanilla ice cream. Like, I don't know, like vanilla ice cream is great. You know, lots of people like it. There many people love it. I don't know, like it's sort of, it's this thing that everyone likes, but uh, or like, I don't know, like, let's say uh, I have Gap t-shirts, you know, Gap t-shirts are great. You know, they're, they're very comfortable. Do people have a, you know, love Gap t-shirts? Uh, you know, maybe, maybe not. Like they don't have the strong sense of belonging to it. Uh, so yeah, so, so try to avoid that. Yeah, uh, because uh, maybe, yeah. What's that? Continue. Well, uh, like okay. uh, maybe because most people like, uh, they're afraid of, of voicing, um, the wrong opinions. I, I think you talked about that with, with the uh, ML Street, uh, uh, Street oh. Talk uh, podcast, right? So, so uh, like maybe you could uh, glance over why, like how, why should you like voice your opinion, even if they could be wrong, right? Okay, I'll give you an example. I'll give you two examples actually, because I think this is a point that comes up a lot. Um, so uh, in, one of, in one of my chapters in my ebook was about physics. It was about like Lagrangian physics, which is basically a way to, optimize the energy of a system to find the best solution. So it's sort of like this weird intersection and in, in doing physics in a machine learning way, as opposed to solving equations, you're minimizing some sort of potential function. And I thought it was really interesting. I'm like, oh, wow, that's a parallel. Like, I, I don't think a lot of ML people are aware of this idea. And I'm like, well, maybe it can help RL people. And so I wrote a blog post about it. And the responses were really funny because some people loved it. You know, they're like, this is amazing. Look, wow, you explained this so clearly. And other physicists were like, how dare you talk about physics? Like, you're not a physicist. Like, where did you go to school? Like, you, you can't just talk about shit you don't understand. Uh, excuse me. But, but, but I thought like, well, you know, like, 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 well, but how else would I know that I was wrong? Like, I don't know anyone among my friends or colleagues that does Lagrangian physics, like zero, 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 like no one. So, so I need a way to get feedback, right? And what I realized is the best way to be corrected about something, anything in life, is you share it online and people will tell you why you're wrong, right? And so it hurts, you know, like when people tell you you're wrong, you're gonna be like, oh, it's like, you know, you're like, 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 oh, wow, like I'm dumb and you're gonna feel insecure. But, you know, think of it this way, like now when people tell me you're wrong and you're dumb, I'm like, thank you. And then I'll be like, I fixed this. You know, and I'm like, oh, I'm actually very grateful for this feedback. Other times you'll have trolls. Trolls that will basically say something like, uh, you're dumb and how dare you do this? Like you should like just stop posting on social media. And my answer to a lot of those people is like, oh, like, like oh, like, thank you for your feedback. Like, do you have an article that you've shared that explains this topic better? And often the answer is no, they haven't. And I think it's very easy to basically sit in your basement and hate on people online that are trying to do stuff that are wrong. And I think people that do stuff successfully respect people that try and fail. And so I think it's okay. Like basically it, it's going to hurt your ego. Like no question about that. But it, I think the quicker you get over that feeling, the better. Another example I have is from work. At Microsoft, my first uh, eight months, I was working on ads. Okay. And I was very proud and very uh, like, you know, I didn't want to admit that I had no idea what was going on. 
because it was very complicated. Like there's all these systems and the billing system and the ad system and the relevant system and the ML system. And I had no idea what was going on. And I was basically like a parrot. Like I would go to meetings and I would start like writing down notes. And I felt like very unproductive. Like I wasn't learning anything. And I felt like, okay, maybe with more time, eventually it'll work out. Until I had a more senior PM on my team look at me and he yelled at me and he told me, like, are you here to take notes? Or are you here to make decisions? And I was going to cry. Like, I swear, like, I, I was almost like, this is, it was so brutal because it was like nine months of me feeling useless. And then someone told me to my face, you are useless, right? And it really hurt me. And, and I, I remember after, like right after that meeting, I was sort of shaken up and he sort of took me to the side. He's like, let's talk a bit. And then he told me like, look, you can't do this anymore. This is not working. He says, you need to start more actively making decisions. And once they're wrong, people are going to tell you why they're wrong. But you're not going to learn unless you make decisions, unless you take the risk. And that totally changed my outlook on life in general, like whether it's about writing a blog post, whether it's at work. I have no shame. Like I'm very happy to be proven wrong because my goal, like often like what I'll say is like, I want the product to be as good as possible. I want the, the blog post to be as good as possible. I want to make as many friends as possible. I don't care if my ego gets hurt because it's sort of a necessary side effect. And it's almost a function, like we're in a difficult field. Like the math is hard, there's programming, there's systems. Like how can I possibly know everything? Like I'm always going to sound dumb to someone. And so instead of worrying about this, I would rather sound dumb and meet the smart people and then become friends with them. So basically the person correct, correcting me if they're nice becomes a good mentor. And if they corrected me and they're a hater, it's someone I know I should block on social media. So I think like the, okay, so, so I have this whole other blog post by the way where I talk about interviews. Uh, I think just as a pro tip, if you've ever done a text screen before, I, I need you to, to know that text screens are a stress test. They're not a programming test. So if you're going in with your palms sweating and your back is sweating and you're very stressed and you're very nervous and you really want the job, you're probably gonna do a bad job. And this is counterintuitive, right? Like the less you care, the better you're gonna do. But it is true and it is something I've observed in my career. And I have a whole blog post by the way, I just talk about my, my, my interview failures. It's very painful. I think you should go read it. So if you're ever worried about oversharing on, on or look sounding stupid online, please read that post and, and look at the extent uh, I'm willing to sound stupid online. I think maybe it'll give, it'll give you some good perspective. Uh, but you know, I want to talk about this for a second because typically when you're interviewing, how do you get an interview, right? It's basically your CV looks good. Well, like what makes a CV look good? Well, high prestige. Like you went to Stanford, you went to MIT. Like people are going to interview you very easily. Uh, and then once you're at the interview, the, your, your, the, you, what you need to do is not get stressed. Like as long as you don't have a mental breakdown, you're already like on a pretty good path, like on an interview, like you'll do a pretty good job. But let's say, let's say you don't, you didn't have the luxury of getting accepted to Stanford or MIT. Like, is it over? No. I think that the one way to get the prestige that you want is a credential. And another is to have a portfolio. So let's think about this for a second. Like what, what, why am I on all the social medias? LinkedIn, for example, has pretty much replaced CVs. Like people, you know, they'll use a CV as a formality, but LinkedIn has more or less replaced them. Uh, if I want to figure out how a person thinks or what do they care about, I can go to their Twitter or Hacker News. Like, for example, again, because I've met Abdullah many times on Twitter, I know that we have a good fit together. So if he ever wants to work with me, I'm happy to talk to him. So that I don't need to t interview him on because I know from our social stuff that this is true. Uh, let's say, but with blog posts, like whether it's Medium or a blog or a Substack, like anything where you're writing an article in long form, well, this gives me a pretty good idea of how would you go about thinking a problem through, like a long form, here's a project spec, here's what's important, here's what's not important. Uh, I feel like there's so many people that I feel I know online as if they're my best friends, even though we've never met in person. And this is not an accident, right? Because by writing something, you're really forced to summarize it really well. Uh, and so it gives me a pretty good idea of what you care about. GitHub, for example, is basically a project portfolio. So you could have this portfolio be uh, stuff you've plagiarized from other people, or you could have a small app that solves a unique problem. And all of a sudden you're very differentiated. All of a sudden you are one in a million because most people don't write open source libraries. Again, the PyTorch has four people, you know, keep thinking about these things. This makes you very differentiated. If you even bother trying, 
not even if you do it successfully, not even if you have a project as successful as Python, if you just bother to put your code online and it solves a new problem in a clear way, you are already one in a million. So do it. That, that, that there's more there. There's more like that makes you more uh, rarer than people that went to MIT. And you can do this from the comfort of your own home sitting in the video, right? And lastly, I want to talk about Twitch. Like, why, why do I go? Why, why, like, so I, I live stream quite a bit. Like, why do I do it? Uh, people think it's because I'm, I, I'm actually using it for very selfish reasons. It's not because I want to spread my knowledge or whatever. It's because it forces me to not procrastinate. Like, I'm literally sitting broadcasting to the world. I am going to show you how to implement birth from scratch. And so if it takes me 10 hours to do it, I'm going to get very embarrassed. So then what ends up happening is that I end up finishing it in two to three hours on average. And let's say now, but you know, you think of coding screens, for example, I don't find them stressful anymore or systems interviews at all, because I just do it all the time. Like instead of doing it only for jobs that I really care about, I'm doing it multiple times a week, all the time. And I constantly look dumb and I constantly get stuck and I constantly get lost over stupid stuff, but it helps me get rid of the stress aspect. So now I can interview a lot better in general without it feeling like work. Like if I'm on lead code all day, it sucks. It's very stressful. It's demotivating, you know, you're grinding, but Twitch is fun because I have people coming in and chat. Like I have people like, uh, like Mazin, like Susan Mays will always show up and like they're posting memes and we're joking about it. So it gives me also like a sense of community and encouragement that I feel like someone else is finding what I do valuable. And so it makes me want to do it more. So there's another thing to think about, like maybe you'll end up liking different social media platforms more than others, but I just want to give you an idea of why I like them and what, what value I get from each one of them. So what's the end goal of all of this? Like, you know, I talked about the sovereign student, but you know, what I want you to think about in, in your life is how can you be like a sovereign researcher? As in, how can you build your own tool, tools? How can you never gatekeep? Like you're always on the lookout for interesting ideas from people and filtering them and helping people fresh out their ideas that you don't necessarily care about peer review. You get your blog posts cited because they're that good. Uh, you know, you hold your, you host your own conferences. Like well, if a conference, if you don't think conferences are interesting, just host your own, like bring the your people you find interesting. Uh, but also I think being financially independent is a big part of it. Like, because you can't do any of these things unless you have somewhat of a safety net. And so whether you get this financial safety net by working at Google or starting your own company or starting your own consultancy, it doesn't matter. Like what matters is the safety net and how you get it, I think matters very little. Uh, and of course, like, this idea of learning anything. And I think like learn anything is really like the sovereign student is really just about this last part. It's about how do you learn anything at a scale. But I think of it as one puzzle piece to be an interesting person online, right? Like, like it's, you know, like, in, like one thing I've been repeating to a lot of people is that uh, in the internet, right? Uh, people have finite attention. Like ultimately I have only, I don't know, 10 hours in the day where I'm gonna be staring at my computer doing ML stuff at the most. Um, and so I'm naturally going to gravitate towards the best content. And this is something we're not used to thinking about where, you know, like before, maybe if you were like an average ML person, like that would be fine. But now you can't really be afford to be average because you're competing against the best people because people are seeing your content online. But at the same time, I don't want this to be discouraging because the vast majority of people online don't even try to be interesting because they just plagiarize content from popular ML books and then they may use them as medium articles that they put on towards the data science. Like this is what people think being interesting online. I'm telling you like make it, make, make a variation, like talk about proteins, talk about, talk about like the city that you live in, talk about adapting a model to the Arab world, talk about your, like you're in oil and gas, like talk about oil and gas and ML. Like, I mean, how many tutorials are there on this topic? Like, you know, maybe less than five, I would say probably online. How many are there to implement logistic regression from scratch? Maybe tens of thousands. So just by narrowing your interests, uh, you can stand out and become a more interesting person online. Uh, so lastly, I, I have to talk about this, like a confidence. So I, I wasn't a confident person in my early 20s. Uh, because I was constantly thinking, oh, I don't want to seem wrong. And maybe this person is, is better than me at this stuff. I just want you to get rid of this concept, right? Like, I want you to think about, uh, you know, you need to show your best self. So how you brand yourself matters a lot. Like, if you go to a company right now in, in, in Riyadh and you brand yourself as a database engineer, you're not going to make a lot of money. But if you brand yourself as an ML engineer, you're going to make a lot of money. And, the, and you're actually going to work less as well. So, you know, but now think of it this way, like what if you're also the ML engineer, but you also have the DB skill set 
like all of a sudden you, you've actually turned into a core asset for a company where you're unfireable, like you're uncancelable, like people need you forever because you're providing real value to people. Uh, so I'm not telling you this to say, don't learn real skills. But what I'm telling you is that the branding, uh, so maybe if you combine these two dogs together, you can end up becoming a very interesting person very quickly and very valuable to your company. So just something to think about. Uh, last thing I want to talk about like briefly, this is, a, this is the most common question I get asked, by the way. Should I do a master's or PhD in machine learning? The single most common question I get asked by DM. Okay, so I have this flow chart that's helpful, right? So it starts by, are you in debt? You know, if yes, don't do a PhD. Do you already have a job in ML? If yes, don't do a PhD. Uh, are you only getting a PhD so that you can go work at Google? Uh, if yes, go and get a PhD because you can just practice coding interviews and it takes you less than six years to get a job at Google if you really want it. Uh, if you need, do you need a US visa? Yes do a PhD, right? And this is, I think, an important thing to consider for internationals. It's why I think internationals are overly represented in PhD programs in the US because it's a very good way of, of getting your foot in the door. Same for a master's, like even though, uh, so I, I'm a US citizen as well, but I don't think I would have gotten job offers from the US had, did, had I not had a US credential. So this is an important thing to think about. It's like, like where do you wanna geographically be? And if you wanna be in the US, I think a master's or PhD is one of the best ways uh, to go about it. I want to talk about, oh, can you guys still hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. It, it crashed a bit. But, but uh, the, the, your screen is frozen, I guess. But... Oh, let me, let me, let me reshare. Sorry. What about now? Yeah, you're good. Okay. Excellent. So the last thing I want to tell you is that small steps add up. So the, the left here, I have the I have the first commit that was made to the hugging face repo. It was just literally a readme that says PyTorch pre-trained BERT. So they just literally ported an, an existing model in TensorFlow to PyTorch. Fast forward a couple of years later, they're saying stuff in their press releases like, I think one of the big challenges you have in ML is it seems that most power is concentrated in the hands of a couple of big organizations. And we've always had acquisition interest from big tech and others, but we believe it's good to have independent companies. That's what we're trying to do. And you're like, whoa, whoa, like it's, you just start from like this cute little, you know, like commit. Now you're like, you want to like decentralize the world and like destroy big tech. And so, and I think this is an important thing to keep in mind is that like, well, if, if they said, well, like who cares about PyTorch and uh, you know, really uh, Google, the Google people invented it. So why are we the ones copy pasting it? They would have never gotten to the point where they're worth like hundreds of millions of dollars or, or raising $40 million. So small, st small public steps add up. I think we're used to saying the small steps add up. This is like sort of a what I call grandma wisdom. Like everyone knows this. But small public steps, I think, is a great way to sort of turn your work into an asset that other people can uh, can leverage. So I think that's it for me. I'm happy to stay to answer as many questions as you want. Uh, but if you have more references that are somewhat related to this, like I have a lot. So I'll, I'll ask uh, uh, Daniel Abdullah to, to maybe share the deck in the YouTube description so you can take a look. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is me. And so I really hope you enjoyed this. Like I certainly enjoyed giving this talk and, and thank you, Dania and Abdullah for giving me the chance to give it. But if you have absolutely any questions about anything I talked about, uh, please let me know. I'm happy to hang out as long as you need me to. Jay, do you want to say something? Or... I just wanted to thank Mark. It was, was very, very interesting. And uh, I really love, you know, his blogs, writing, and the interview with uh, Machine Learning Street Talk, that was very interesting. I love how, uh, you know, you talk about these topics that people don't usually talk about in terms of, you know, managing your career as, uh, you know, as, as a person who wants to grow and, and evolve in this field and how to be, you know, very transparent about it. And you have a lot of, you know, clear thoughts about it, which tells me that you either, you know, write about it to yourself or, I'm curious, you know, how if you have a, a process to get that clarity of thought. But I also, um, I'm wondering, what do you think about um, research, and have you considered, you know, doing research or, as machine learning software engineers, is it, um, do you feel do you feel that allure to, to to contribute and, um, you know, be part of of that, 
you t touched on it a little bit, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, yeah. I, so, so, so yeah, so, so I think there's two questions. Maybe let me start with the first, which is uh, how, how did I come to these conclusions? So I think it really came by being punched in the face after I decided to quit my job at Microsoft. I worked for a year and a half on a reinforcement learning startup for game developers. It didn't work out and I just felt humiliated. Like I felt like I had like sort of like I lost face in front of my friends that, oh my, like I, I'm maybe I'm not even gonna be able to get my old job back. Uh, and that I just sort of did it wrong, you know? And so when I realized later when I was writing the book as a failure state, by the way, when I was writing the book, it was a consolation prize. It was me thinking to myself like, oh, I'm not a talented engineer and I'm just gonna, maybe all I can do is a book. I can't actually build a company. But then when it evolved into something entirely different, that's when I realized like, wait a minute, like I've just been following the wrong advice where I was following advice that's closer to, you know, uh, you know, get venture capital funding, uh, grow the company, get like hundreds of employees uh, and then, you know, go public. But that's actually never what I wanted because I'm not particularly interested in having large teams. And it was only in hindsight after failing this hard that I started becoming very attentive to people that do it differently. So I think one example of this is Hugging Face. Like Hugging Face, yes, they did raise funding, but they sort of built this community first business model that I haven't seen many other people replicate. Uh, there is like another uh, engineer that I really like called Jason Antic who built Deoldify. So Deoldify, for example, was this app that helps you colorize old photos. Uh, some of you may have actually used it as well. And it's sort of like, he, he also did it and it's a two person company. He has no interest in growing. He just wants to basically build a sustainable lifestyle for himself where he doesn't have a boss, where he has like good money. He can live where he wants and have the lifestyle that he wants. And so, yeah, so it was failing. And then after that failure, me becoming very attentive to how things could possibly be different, writing about it, and then meeting people that I think did it better than me. And often what I, what I thought was hilarious is that the people that I thought did it better than me generally really liked the stuff that I wrote. And for me, this was very humbling because I'm like, like, what are you talking about? Like, you already do this, like, you know this. But they're like, no, but actually it was, you know, we didn't know, like we said, maybe we knew it instinctively, but seeing you write it, help them a lot so that that encourages me even more because it's now people that i really admire uh sort of giving me a pat on the shoulder and telling me good job on your second question on research uh it's an interesting question by the way because uh, when i was at microsoft i was initially a product manager uh and i, I knew that i didn't like that job and so eventually uh, i had a scientist on on my team that uh, really liked me and we were good friends and he uh, encouraged me to just switch over to his team He's like, you know, you should just try being a scientist on my team. And what I thought was interesting was even though I had the title scientist, I didn't produce any research. So I saw a cool title that made me feel good. Like I was like, oh, I'm a scientist. Like, you know, a, like I sound smart. Uh, whereas, for example, on the other hand, like when I worked at GraphCore, at GraphCore, my title was field engineer. You know, that doesn't sound as fancy. However, it turns out like I figured out for myself that our customers are researchers. And so what do our customers care about? Well, they don't care about slides. They care about papers. And so I actually went down this path where I wrote papers with my customers and they ended up becoming the best sales collateral ever. And, you know, we're good friends now. Uh, the, like we, we published those papers, they're very good. And so even though I wasn't as in a researcher position, I was able to write a research paper with Peter Abiel's group, who Peter is one of the researchers I admire the most. And, uh, and Luke Metz, who's at Google Brain and Misha, who's at Berkeley. Uh, I was able to collaborate with Michael Bronstein at Twitter, who's like my favorite GNN researcher. And so my point is, you can be a researcher without a PhD. It just, it just you, you need to, I guess, like be useful and confident about it. And to be fair, I mean, I do spend a lot of my time uh, reading papers, like meeting researchers, like coding. Uh, but I, I feel like the, the title doesn't feel that important to me as much as it used to in my early 20s. Now I feel like I can do it just fine without it. So why, why bother spending six years of my career uh, making no money to maybe make more later? I just feel like what I'm doing works better. So I'm just going to keep doing that. Awesome. Clear. Thanks. Good luck with the yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, on that end, uh, like if you could tell us the story of PyTorch and like... Oh yeah, uh, that, that's, that's a good point. That's a good question. So it wasn't very deliberate. So basically, uh, I remember that I, uh, okay, so I was pretty happy at GraphCore. So it wasn't like I wasn't actively interviewing anywhere. So it was very bizarre to me, the fact that 
you know, I, I was on LinkedIn and then I saw that they were hiring for this role that's like an engineer that manages all the external partnerships. And it said that be the first to apply. And it said be the first to apply for like two weeks. And I kept thinking like, well, why is no one applying for this thing? You know, and then I thought like, wait a minute, like maybe they are actually having trouble filling the skill set because how many people do I know that are research engineers that are good with customers that write, that know how to sell, that know how to market, that know how to do videos. And I could think of very few, like maybe like less than a dozen people I can think of in the world that have the skill set. So I'm like, you know, like whatever, like, uh, let me try it. Let me try applying. So, so I applied and then I had a quick chat and then it turns out like the skill set that the, the job description that I built for myself at Graphcore turned out to be exactly what they were looking for. They were looking for a person that can sell, market, write code and do research. And you know, you would think like, well, that's not really a marketable thing. It's very hard to find, but it turns out like I built my own niche and eventually it was really, it was great because I was able to do more of that. I'm able not to do more of that at PyTorch. At a bigger scale, because PyTorch is a huge product, right? It has so many customers, like so many users that, that really like it, a huge community. Uh, and so, yeah, I would say it would have been impossible for me to get this job had I not had Graphcore and had I not built my own niche at Graphcore. I think if I stuck to my job description very narrowly, uh, I don't think there would, there would have been any way that I would have done this. Like basically, had I not realized the things that I told you about today, I don't think I would have gotten the job at all. Like no chance. There have been uh, many other people that have been considered before me. It's amazing. Uh, there's a question uh, from Sultan asking about, like, uh, do you mind talking about uh, reinforcement learning and machine learning investment banking and how hard is it for someone who has no knowledge in coding to learn coding specifically for investments? I know we have a, a, a very uh, uh, a strong opinion about uh, some of the uh, jobs and investments. Yeah, uh, yeah, so, it's okay. So, but, so just a quick question, about, can you still see my video? Uh, no. Okay, one moment. Okay, hello, I'm back. Okay, so uh, yeah, let me, let me talk about this a bit. So when, uh, when I graduated from AUB, at the time what everyone was doing was consulting in Dubai. Like pretty much all the top engineers in my program went into consulting in Dubai, like almost no exception. Uh, very few people went, like maybe the, I think the top person in our class went to MIT to do a PhD in CS. He's very smart and now he's a, he's a senior scientist at Google. But, but I think this was sort of almost like a local optimum that people were optimizing for quite a bit. So let me answer your question first and then let me discourage you from going into investment banking as a second part, as Abdullah may have hinted. Uh, so the first part I will say is in general, like when you're thinking about how can you optimize for portfolios, uh, I generally think of uh, people that try to do algorithms for trading as very similar to palm reading, as in like, you know, you have lines and you're trying to read into these lines and what they mean. And you're like basically overfitting knowledge that doesn't necessarily particularly uh, make sense. And so, I don't know, like it, sometimes I feel like uh, it, it's like, you know, you look at people like I'm like Warren Buffett, they don't trade all that much. You look at people that they just buy and they just hold forever. Or you look at like, let's say people that bought Bitcoin early, they just bought Bitcoin and then they held it forever. And so this idea of like, you know, you can hyper optimize the differences and stuff to me feels like, you know, maybe, maybe you can, maybe you don't. In general, I don't have a lot of respect for like an industry that you know, regularly fails and then needs government bailouts. Like I feel no, the government didn't bail me out when my startup failed and I didn't blame the economy for it. It's just my own fault. I wasn't a good salesman, a good programmer. It's okay. I learned about it. I'll do it again. Uh, and so I think that's something to consider when, when you're, when you're thinking about like a, a skill set like this, I think the one, one aspect of it is thinking, well, will it give you a good financial safety net? Uh, I, I think that's great. Yeah. I mean, sure. If you can go make a lot of money doing it, like, like absolutely go for it. Don't let me discourage you from doing it. But keep in mind that there's always a risk of you turning into a turkey, whether whether you know it or not. Uh, that said, I think there is something interesting where, like, well, if you can imagine that the stock market, imagine the stock market as a simulator that's rewarding you with how much money you're making. Well, now you can sort of formulate the investment banking problem as a reinforcement learning problem. You know, that's great. And if you want to build a simulator that does that, you know, I would probably start that on GitHub. That sounds very interesting. Uh, and I think it's, I think it's a compelling thing to go after and finish, uh, but I wouldn't treat it too strictly. Like, you know, maybe it's interesting, maybe it's not. Uh, I can say for one, 
uh, I, I would, you know, I would avoid these skills right now. And I have been seeing a lot of my friends that started their careers in consulting in Dubai are now PMs at Amazon. Uh, you know, so that tells you something, right? Like maybe those skills are, are a bit more interesting. The way I like to think of it is that I think allocation of money is going to forever be an important problem because money is just foundational to everything that we do. But I think this whole industry is like very ripe for disruption with apps like Cash App or Stripe. I think that like the, the banking business model is going to change a lot in the future. So if that's something you want to pursue, absolutely go for it. But don't assume that because... JP Morgan is chase, chase is huge today that it's going to continue being huge for the future and then hyper optimizing to just get a job there. I think that's very foolish. Optimize for first principles. Like if you're a good programmer, you're a good um, a statistician, you can use these skills, whether you're a geologist, whether you're a scientist, whether you work in big tech, like there are core skills that matter for many in industries. So learn them. If you're interested in banking, go for it, but don't treat it too seriously, I would say. There's another question um, uh, from uh, Parasto, I guess. Uh, and he's asking about, like, he reads papers and he understands them, but when he tries to implement the paper, it's so hard for him to to implement the paper, I guess. So is there okay. an approach maybe you follow to... to... Yeah, so, so there's two tricks. I think one, you have to realize he didn't actually understand the paper. It's sort of a bitter pill to swallow, but... Uh... If you did understand it, you could re-implement it. Not necessarily from memory, but just like with minimal information, you could look at it and do it. So I think there's two tricks that really help here. One is looking, reading open source code. Like if you just go to the PyTorch GitHub, read ResNet, read the RNNs, read the transformer, you'll get 90% of the ideas that people need to implement papers from scratch. And you should be in good shape. So do that. And then when you're trying to implement something from scratch completely, do one thing. You know, don't do 30 papers, just do one paper. If you can do it, you like, like, like doing what it's sort of like, there's a famous Bruce Lee saying, like, I, I don't fear the person that knows a thousand kicks. I know the person that's practiced one kick a thousand times. Uh, I, I think that's how I like to think of it for the depth. But if you just want to get a good idea of how these stuff are implemented under the hood, just read very carefully the code that people that are better programmers than you have written you will learn a lot and a lot more than reading papers or a lot more than reading lectures. Just read the code. Like remember, GitHub archaeology is a real skill. Uh, I had a question uh, on um, uh, your your, uh, your journey as a content creator. So after joining PyTorch, uh, like, uh, do you think how are you able to like to manage? uh producing such content and, and continuing uh with your career do, uh, do you have like a plan to stop uh this pursuit or is it just part of your daily kind of schedule to continue doing like working on it so so i think a big part of my job was going to be like evangelizing certain features or ideas or marking up their importance so like for the evangelizing part like the community part that is really a content part right it's sort of whether it's interesting tutorials or interesting videos or interesting features that no one knows how to use or prioritizing features that people really want but don't exist. So I think I'm going to get a lot more time to do this for my day job. Uh, I think though, like what I'm thinking a lot more about right now is sort of like, what's the next level, right? Like, I mean, like, like I wrote like a controversial article, but that's not like my identity. Like, I don't want to keep writing like these hot takes. Like I'm keep thinking like, how can this be better? How can it be even more interesting? Uh, and so that's why, for example, the next article I've been really working on, but it's been taking me forever to finish it, uh, is basically this new business model for how can you be a two-person company? Uh, so look at, or like, let's say the com more community-based startups like Hugging Face, like taking a deeper look at why I think they were successful where others failed. Uh, so that I will continue being interested. Like I will continue pursuing ideas that I think are interesting outside of PyTorch. But I also think PyTorch is going to give me a lot of flexibility to talk about PyTorch. And this is good for me because I think PyTorch is great. So like it's a, it's a product that sells itself, I think in some sense, because people enjoy using it. So if I do that, I, I, feel, I would feel very fortunate. And thankfully, I think that's gonna be what my job's gonna look like. Uh, well, on, on the topic of uh, uh, crafts and, and uh, skills uh, and the Turkey issue, uh, have you been like asked about GPT-3 and like uh, 
how uh, like language models as, as they scale GPTN is going to replace coding or whatsoever. What's your take on this? Um, so I have two uh, two opinions on this that are contradictory. So like uh, which is you know <laughs> anyway I'll, I'll let you I'll let you make your opinion. I'll, I'll let you know what I think. So on one hand, I think that it's very easy to criticize stuff without making it better. Um, the people that I hate the most are like, I hate movie critics. Like, cause I feel like, like, what do you do? Like you just sit and you criticize stuff that you think is poor. Like, are you able to make something as good? So that's why when I think of critics, like the, typically when I look at movie critic critiques, I like seeing movie critiques by other directors. Cause I feel like at least they, they know somewhat what they're talking about or by an audience. So like sort of a, a lay person, but it's a sort of intermediate class of a critic I really despise. Uh, and especially when it comes to ML, I think there's a lot of critics, like people that just like say, no, but maybe we should use more symbolic ideas or we should use more connection or whatever. And I'm like, great, like you think we should do that. Show me, show me a benchmark where your ideas are better. And then they're like, well, but the common benchmarks aren't good. And I go like, well, create a benchmark literally where your approach is gonna be better than other ones. Like literally like, think of the most like, weirdly twisted data set where you think your ideas is going to shine and then publish that and show people that you think your ideas are, are better. And if you can't do that or do something better on a benchmark, then maybe your ideas aren't that good. And maybe that's just a bitter pill that you need to swallow, that maybe scale is, is better than, than elegant ideas. However, I think with GPT-3, uh, what people are saying is that, well, there's going to be diminishing returns, right? Like GPT-4 isn't going to be exponentially better than GPT-3, even though we're adding exponentially more compute. So at some point, it's not going to be economical. And I think these companies aren't stupid, right? They know that they can't spend money uh, forever. But for now, it seems to be working fine. And it seems to be working fine. It's, it's more like an example I like to give is that, let's say I tell you, like, hey, you want to build an NLP startup. Like, would you rather I give you uh, $300,000 in compute, or would you rather I give you three data scientists that you each pay $100,000, right? So I think that's very telling, right? And so if you pick the compute, that tells you that you don't think that arcane architectures are going to have any benefit. You still think there's trivial scale will still have more benefits. Um, so yeah, that, that's sort of my, my opinion there. I don't know if that answers your question very clearly, but like I said, I have a double uh, double opinion on this. But maybe on, on like one of the talks you talked about like having a skill of uh, uh, a, a GPT-3 prompt engineer and uh, you know on the topic of PIP engineering. So uh, huh. uh, like uh, PIP installed uh, six-figure careers is something that uh, people maybe should should take into it, uh, like huh. take a look into it. So maybe you could expand on that. Uh, 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 sure. Yeah. Um, so basically, so I had a like so the I I have a joke. PIP library called uh, Six Figure Career. So you can just PIP install Six Figure Career. It works, it doesn't do anything. But you know, the promise is that it'll give you a Six Figure Career. And it was really a, a joke meant at people that do very bad tutorials on Medium. It's sort of like you're PIP installing Hugging Face and then you're like, I wanna show you how to you know, use uh, Hugging Face. And I'm like, oh, I wanna show you how to tokenize something with Hugging Face. And, oh, and, it, and it's like, well, but there's already the docs. Like you're not providing any value. Like, like they literally told you how to do it and you're copy pasting it and putting it behind a paywall. Uh, I'm not sure if you have uh, any more questions, Daniel. So I see Fahad has a question. Uh, uh, <laughs> Mazin is asking, should you invest in Julia? Okay, I think Julia is similar to the Turkey problem. Like, I would say yes, because I think differentiable computing is very exciting. And I think Julia has the most interesting programming language ideas among any deep learning library. And if you're a hard scientist, like a chemist or a physicist or a biologist or an astronomer, they have so many libraries where often instead of reading a physics textbook, I'll go to a Julia physics library and like just to get a good idea of like what's involved. Like, like, and you get a pretty first principles understanding of physics. So yes, definitely invest in it. 
but that's to say that don't take a religious attitude to it where you say, I'm only going to get a job if it's in Julia. Because those jobs don't really exist. They're not plentiful. But prompt engineer jobs definitely exist. GPT, prompt engineer, well, you can probably make good money off it. So the strategy, I think, is the barbell strategy there, which is learn, like, learn a lot of the basics that will give you a good safety net. Build the safety net for yourself and then use the safety net to learn more weird stuff that you think has the, benefit, the potential of being very big in the future. And if you're already rich, like let's say uh, you're, uh, I don't know, like, you, I don't know, you, your parents own an oil field and you're, you're, you're great and you, know, you, you have like stacks of gold in, in your basement, then maybe you don't need to invest in prompt engineering. But if you don't have that, then you, you actually kind of do because a safety net is very important for you to take risks because it means that even if like, in my case, I tried to start it, but it didn't work out. I just found a job. I wasn't on the streets. I wasn't like mortgaging my home. I wasn't like, you know, uh, you know, flipping bird. Like it, it's like, it, it's like things went back to normal. The only thing that was bruised was my ego. And that's not that bad in the grand scheme of things. It's not like making sure that it's not like your family's going to be out on the streets. So uh, maybe a last question before we uh, uh, end the session. Uh, a question from MT. I think you touched upon upon it during the talk, but maybe you could uh, reiterate on that. He's asking like, uh, do you think that we should stay in our countries? And I'm guessing the guys from uh, uh, from Iran and is asking if he can still make money in the internet, say by Bitcoin, or should he apply for a PhD and change the origin country, like work in the US or whatsoever? Like, okay. maybe can you make money online on the long term? I guess is the, uh, is the yeah. So, so 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 let me put this in perspective a bit. So a lot of well, when you think about like what I should be doing, think about like what's better for me, given the situation that I'm in, not what's better in the absolute. What I mean by that is that like, let's say if, if I were to, I don't know, think of like my dream job, it's be like, okay, I'm leading like reinforcement learning at OpenAI. Like that's a pretty good job, but I don't actually have a good way of, of getting this kind of job. Or like, let's say I'd be doing something like Yuri. And so instead, like you can follow a gradient of what you think is better. <clears throat> so when you're thinking about like, should I do a PhD in ML or should I stay in my country of origin and buy Bitcoin? You know, you can buy Bitcoin with very little effort, so you can do that if you want. But, you know, I, I'm assuming that you also want to acquire some skills in your life besides just acquiring Bitcoin and waiting waiting for it to moon. Like, you know, so, so if you feel like you can get a good ML job in your country of origin and make money, go for it. But if you've tried and have failed to do, there's no shame in getting a PhD. Just think of what is pragmatic given the situation I'm in. And I will say for a lot of, uh, for a lot of career questions, I would encourage you to come to the Robot Overlords Discord uh, and then you maybe ask these questions in longer form because I think you should never take advice that's very major in your life based on what some dude online thinks. You know, it's a, it's a good rule of thumb, you know, just like, like think of through things a bit carefully. Uh, but yeah, like think of your unique situation. Think of what, what will put you in a better situation than where you're at right now. Like let's say in my case, a master's in computer science eight years ago was the single best professional investment I made in my life. Think about it. I paid about $30,000 a year, right? So for two years, that's about 60,000. Second year, I TA'd, so I paid like 10,000. So I paid about $40,000 a year to, at Microsoft, make a job, get a job that made me about 170K a year. So I paid back for my investment immediately. So of course it was a good investment. I made back my money very easily. Whereas what's not a good investment, it's, I don't know if you do a PhD in sociology, then you know, that's, that's a bit more of a questionable investment because are you gonna go make this kind of money right after? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, the way I think of media in general, like let's say making money online, uh, you know, I'm probably not the best person to answer that because I, I still make less than $500 a year online based on the content that I make. So can I make a living off of it? You know, prob probably not. Like if I lived with my, with my parents and you know, they spent everything, sure I could. Uh, but, you know, I, I want to make my own living. I want to be independent myself and learn stuff. So the way I think of it is like a day job is still the best way for me right now to make money. And if ever my media stuff gets out of control where it's like I'm making so much money off of it that I don't need a job. Yeah, of course, sure. I'll reevaluate it or maybe I'll start a company again. But right now, that's not the best choice for me right now. By far, the best professional decision I can make is go work at Python. So, of course, I'm going to go do that. Well, Mark, uh, with that, like, I want to thank you very much for your time. Uh, I know that uh, we, we've uh, uh, scratched a few topics uh, on mind and you just prepared this in, in no time. So 
thank you so much uh, for for attending and saying thank you for everyone. Like we never had such session where we stayed like an hour and a half, and most of the people are still around. So that tells you uh, how how much people are interested in what you said. So uh, thank you so much, and uh, I'm not sure if if uh, if the audience has any more questions, uh, but well. We can Actually, stick yeah. around for a couple of minutes if it. Yeah, let me share the. Let me share the deck here. Let us do. Yeah, this we'll, is the deck, and if you we'll, want to add to this, yeah, screen. we'll post it on Twitter as well. So uh, everything in terms of material, maybe to the audience, we'll we'll share everything on on Twitter as well, and on Meetup if if you're uh, registered there as well. I highly uh, recommend that you follow uh, Mark on Twitter and on YouTube, and if you. Like if you watch Twitch, follow him on Twitch. Like he dives into so many topics uh, that are quite interesting. Even if, like for people who are not like focused on, on uh, like ML, he dives into compilers and uh, you know GPUs and stuff that you never know that you actually want to understand. But eventually, it could help at some point. So I'll always comes uh, up. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank so, you. Thank you so much, Abdullah. I'm very flattered. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, sorry, Danny. I, I didn't hear. You. I think I spoke over you. I apologize. <laughs> no, it's okay. I was I was saying that you're in all your uh, materials that you post online. It's it's kind of like the butter of the the topics. So, well, thank you. That that means a lot. Thank you. I'm very honored. All right. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye.